Jeff and uh, all of the volunteers that you recognized at one o'clock, so it takes a full team to put on events. I, I host running events, large running events, so I kind of, it's like it's showtime, but so much goes on, you know, and every volunteer really counts or else the, it falls apart. But it's certainly a pleasure to be here. I remember going to the early conferences up in Breckenridge and Vail and people get altitude sickness, so this is probably a little safer, safer venue and easy, easier access. But I'm gonna try to fly through in 30 minutes what could be a three-day seminar. So there is a lot on endurance training out there and all the metabolomics of that. So I'll kind of like give you an introduction to everything here today. And um, so let's just kind of go through. So my disclosures, I own a shoe store. I've seen a lot of these nice minimal shoes around, so that's pretty cool. I'm a board member of the Society of Metabolic Health Practitioners. It's got the shirt on. And so it's cool to have our own organization now to really talk about metabolism and try to you know, be a subspecialty. I'm on the Lydiard Foundation, which is a foundation promoting endurance sports and health. Um, founding member with Nina of the Nutrition Coalition and I'm an advisor for uh, Abbott Freestyle Libre done some research on, on there. So another disclosure, you know, so I'm, an, I'm a runner, but I, I come here not to bury strength training, but to praise it. And I come here not to bury high intensity, but to praise it. But what I want to show you in this 30 minutes is without doing that base endurance work, this stuff becomes extremely difficult. So, so doing that endurance work supports us to do everything else we need to do really in, in life. And life is a strength training event when we talk about healthy aging. So the objectives, you could kind of read them quickly there. So we're going to give a little background just on exercise and health as really that is the magic pill. We talk a lot about nutrition, but really without exercise, it all falls apart. You know, what is this zone two thing? Is this anything new? It's really not anything new. I'm just going to help define what that is when you hear about it on podcasts and the media. Talk a little bit about lactate. When I went to medical school, lactate was associated with sepsis. And when I ran, ran track in college, lactic acid was what made us stop running. So I think, yeah, it has this negative connotation, but I think we've learned a little bit. Lactate's like a magical fuel. So, so we're going to re reshape lactate in your mind. And I think this is critically important. And this is what I want you really to do some reading about is what is the difference between a high performer and a metabolic syndrome patient and how this lactate metabolism type 1 fiber mitochondria work because we need to train those two groups different and that's really important because most of us are treating the super sick we're not treating elite athletes but we can learn a lot from what happens in the the best athletes in the world now if you're into a lot of the deep science of this and you know want to geek out i have a dropbox folder that has about 50 articles on all of this stuff. <laughs> so you could probably spend a good weekend reading about metabolomics and mitochondria. You know, how do we do science and medicine? So that car you have out there, really, you know, how that works, and you hope it works pretty well, but it's based on all the technology of a Formula One car. You know, it's not based on what's happening in a broken down car. But if you look at medicine, you know, so we went to medical school, we're dealing with these metabolic disease patients who I would call the homo sick, maybe a little evolutionary uh, side of this. And we compare them to control groups or, or the well couch potatoes. See, these are the well in, in medicine, where they would be called homo sedentary. Now, probably all of you out there strive to be kind of the recreational athletes. You know, everyone's an athlete, just some of us are training for some, something, some of us aren't. So maybe that's the homo active. But then the homo badasses, these people have the perfect mitochondria. And none of us in the room are one of those, other than Sean left earlier today. So Sean maybe fits the homo badass category. But um, he probably has perfect. And the, the people with perfect mitochondria, as you saw in my lead slides, you know, become a better butter burner and bagel burner. You know, so the best functioning mitochondria can burn carbs and fat remarkably well. So it's, so it's not that the carbs are bad. If you're a perfect specimen, you can eat a lot of carbs and do just fine, but most of us aren't dealing with them. So, so when we study, you know, so we need to look at human uh, perfect physiology and learn from that and trickle it down. So we look at scientists, coaches, and athletes. You know, so the scientists always catch up to what the athletes have done. You know, why does this work now, and how can we apply this to our own lives and our patients? So the optimum human, you know, so hardware, you know, you saw Sean, you know, he's strong, he's probably got good bone density, you know, then movement, um, that's, you know, I teach a lot of running biomechanics, barefoot running, so we have to move the body well. But then there's these energy systems, you know, these are the, the mitochondria, you know, and, and I'm just tagging on to what so many speakers up here, no matter what their topic has been, it all comes down to the mito mitochondria. You know, I'm just going to share a few of these scientists that these, you know, you stand on the shoulders of people that have really done the hard work. You know, Dr. Tim Noakes, we're all familiar with him, the original sports scientist. You know, I got to meet Dr. Peter Snell, 
who uh, won three and a uh, Kiwi, right? So we got Nikki. So won three Olympic gold medals, and he won by like a landslide in Olympic events. And he went on to become a sports scientist to discover really why did he win these gold medals? And they and they did all this endurance training, even to win 800 meter races. So this was I listened to a talk of his at the end of his career. Why slower running makes you faster? Dedicated to his coach Arthur Lydiard. And so it was like the deep dive into all this about 15 years ago, actually 2011, maybe not that, so, so 13 years ago. Um, I went down to New Zealand to go like to the heartland to learn, uh, learn from these people. Dr. Keith Livingston and Olympic medalist Lorraine Moeller and Rod Dixon, you know, are living this and teaching uh, Arthur Lydiard's principles really as a foundation of health, not necessarily high athletic performance. How many in the room have heard of Dr. Phil Maffetone? Yeah, so he's like Yoda. So, so like he's the guy that, you know, and back in the 80s, everyone was broken and they go to him in the desert, you know, and he'd tell them to slow down and get off refined carbohydrates and, you know, come talk to me in six months. And they would like, re, re, you know, restore their careers. And he wrote this book. This was really influential in my life. I think it was 2009 it was published. It was called In Fitness and in Health because fitness doesn't mean health. Um, so, you know, go read anything um, from Phil Mathetone, but he publishes a lot with Dr. Parr Lawson. I think he's also a Kiwi, or Australia. So he has a, he has a site called Hit Science. So there's this, you know, hypothesis out there, like if you're doing high intensity work, you have to be on high carbs, you know, because you have all the glycolytic pathways. And he shows that if you're fat adapted, you can go do high intensity work just fine you know, maintain your muscle mass. So it's got about 200 publications, Dr. Paul Larson. Uh, uh, Veronique Berlot from France has about 300 publications to her name. And she's dug into the training of athletes. And what she's shown, you know, no matter what endurance sport it is, the highest level athletes always do about 80 to 90% of their training, like conversational pace. Right? And she has all the data from the Kenyans, the cross-country skiers, you know, going back through time. So these people, and Dr. Steven Seidler, he's another one. Anyone heard of Dr. Steven Seidler? So he's, he's the one who really coined the term polarized training. And again, he's done, you know, deep dive into a lot of the skiers, the runners, the rowers. And they all do about 80, he calls it 80-20. They do 80% of their training in what we would call zone one or zone two, which is below this aerobic threshold. But, you know, he gave a TED talk, you know, and he applies it. So what can we take from those people and apply it to normal people like us? These two people are brilliant. Dr. George Brooks, about 30 years ago, discovered what's called the lactate shuttle. And I didn't fully understand that until I started reading George Brooks's work. And Inigo Samalan up the road in a University of Colorado, has, he, uh, he is the coach of uh, uh, Pogacar, a two-time Tour de France um, winner. So he's studying uh, Warburg, cancer, diabetes. So he's applying everything he's learning from you know, the Team UAE, who's won multiple Tour de France's and bringing it down you know, to the, to the metabolically sick patients. Dr. Dan Plews, go to his website. So he's a, he's an, a coach, PhD, about 100 publications, um, athlete himself. We all know these folks, Finney and Valexa. All this stuff is out there about fat adaptation. The coaches, so Arthur Lydiard passed away about 10 years ago, but he said champions are everywhere. You just have to train them. And he was actually the first person to develop cardiac rehab. So in New Zealand, you know, in the 60s, if people had cardiac disease, they did this uh, Lydiard program, which started walking, and he got them to jog 30 minutes a day, right? And that was like, now it's like, that's pretty standard, but that was, you know, you know pretty uh, rogue in America, because what do we tell cardiac patients to do in America? Rest. <laughs> yeah, you must rest the body. But he said the heart's another muscle that needs to be trained. And um, that gentleman there, uh, Andy Stedman, after his coronaries, went out for a jog with this gentleman here, Bill Bowerman, who was the founder of Nike and the coach at University of Oregon. And he was a 10th Mountain Division soldier, but had gotten kind of out of shape. And that cardiac patient dropped him going up the first hill on this little jog. He called it jogging. That word was not available in America yet. So he goes to Lydiard and said, what, what are they doing? He says, well, that's my cardiac rehab. They're doing jogging. And so he showed up every day with that group for about three months, lost about five inches off his waist, several kilos, came back, um, found religion, and found a jogging in America and wrote this little book that sold about eight million copies. You know, and he said, if you have a body, you are an athlete. So let's learn a little bit from the athletes. So one of the greatest athletes out there that I heard speak is this guy, Arnolfo Kimare, and he beat Scott Jurek in the Copper Canyon in the book Born to Run. And someone asked him a question, how do you train? And through about three translators, he speaks Ra Mari, and he says he had this quizzical look. He, 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 doesn't, he doesn't even know what that word means. He just walks kind of from village to village. 
I mean, he might jog a little bit, and he was th beat the best ultra runner in the world. So it's like, wow. And there he is at the Boston Marathon with his full gear. Frank Short, I heard Frank talk, and he said this. He, didn't, he was a lawyer and an athlete. He, he wasn't a scientist, but he knew that the more he did harder training, the more he had to do the slow endurance training, or it would fall apart. Has anyone in the room here done a lot of intensity training without doing some easier walking endurance training and somehow fell off a cliff? Like you've just, phew. yeah, I think we, all of us who've competed have, have gone there and we'd keep making the same mistakes. Lorraine Muller and Rod Dixon, who I showed before, so they had some of the longest careers. Uh, Lorraine participated in four Olympic marathons, you know, and Rod, he, he was a three-time three Olympian for New Zealand. Mark Allen, many have heard that name, so he had lost six Ironmans to this guy, Dave Scott, and then he went out to the woods and found Maffetone, slowed down, came back, and won six Ironmans. He was about to quit, you know, but people remember him for his six Ironman victories, but people don't understand much what went behind that. He was about to quit after losing to this guy. Tim Olson was the first person to uh, finish the Western States 100 before the sun went down. You see, it's, it's still light, <laughs> so, and uh, now it's, it's happening more common. But Dave Scotty, he ended up having a cardiac condition, um, and now he actually is complete opposite. He coaches a lot of triathletes, and he says, I did it all wrong. So it's interesting. They all come around. Camille Heron, who owns every world record in ultra running for women, she was an early adopter of Maffetone, lives in Oklahoma, wonderful, joyful human, um, so we can learn from Camille. Tour de France champs, Chris Froome went on a low-carb diet, dropped several kilos, did a lot of his own two training, and sure enough, you know, he, four Tour de France, huge. This guy's amazing, Elliot Kipchoge, broke two hours in a marathon. You know, so never been done. He had some pacing help, but he also holds the world record without pacing at 201. But his zone two, so this is what zone two is. So you see that green area there? That green curve is fat oxidation. Okay, so at what effort, at what pace, at what power output, at what heart rate are you maximally utilizing fat for fuel? That means you're maximally typing, tag, tagging into the type one fibers maximally stressing the mitochondria and the type 1 fibers which love fat for fuel. And then at a certain point you kind of go off that cliff. So he's going out the door and he's burning more and more and more and more fat. He's burning max fat at about a five minute a mile. So his zone two is like, you know, we would be dropped at 100 meters. So just because someone says zone two doesn't mean it's easy. He's having a conversation at that pace, but we would, you know, make it 50 meters. And, and drop. But you see, at a certain point when the glycolytic flux, where we need to produce more ATP than the fat can produce, we shift over to carbohydrate metabolism. It's a quicker, more accessible source, you know, so the glucose utilization goes up, fat goes down, we accumulate more lactate. If we can't clear the lactate, we get more acidotic and you, and you shut down. So we want to kind of move that green zone to the right. You know, and there's so many, we can talk about in the Q&A, so many different features of how you live, even your genetics and sex, you know, women do it better than men, they can burn fat better, you know, contribute to moving that to the right. Zach Bitter is a podcast host with Sean Baker, carnivore, 100 mile record holder, you know, so he's dug a lot into the science. This is a friend of mine, Amanda Stevens, and that's an Ironman under nine hours. So if any of y'all like understand what that is, that's like amazing, but she was broken, 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 and Phil, La uh, Phil Maffetone and La Paul Lawson wrote an article on her. She, she, her stomach would go every time because she needed the carbohydrates to keep up with the energy demand, and then you'd throw up, you'd throw up, you'd throw up. It's hard to like digest 800 calories of carbohydrates an hour while you're you know, doing a, a Kona Ironman in 100 degree heat. So then she shifted, turned her food pyramid upside down, cut back her training, and look at, the, look at her macros there, nutrient dense macros, as Marty you know, pointed out. And uh, yeah, and her performance, but her recovery and her health just got so much better. So if Andreas is here, this is the, the rock star of Sweden, you know, is pretty much blown away every Olympic race and speed skating. And he spends hours and hours and years and years in this easier zone one or zone two because that allows him to do high intensity. And he has about a 60 page PDF which goes deep dive into his training if anyone's interested in Nils Vanderpool. Killian Journey, the best mountain runner in the world. He's a massive fat burner, but he eats a lot of carbs. You're like, wait, that's a paradox. It's because his mitochondria are perfect. He eats a lot of carbs, but he never eats them before he runs. 
He goes out the door and he can run like six hours without eating anything. You know, but most of his running is in the zone one, zone two pace. But again, for him, like we could, if he's in zone two, we, would, we wouldn't last probably 100 meters because he's super fit. Chelsea Sodaro won this year's Ironman. Um, trains under Dan Plew. She calls it right fuel, right time. So her training adaptation, when she first met Dan Plews, she would go out the door, carbohydrate uh, utilization would go up, fat utilization would go down, and ultimately we're very limited in our carbohydrates. You're going to kind of, you know, either your blood glucose will run low, glycogen depletion, you're not going to be able to sustain your pace for eight to nine hours. But then she shifted her diet and did different training, which is probably proprietary, how she trains with watts. But now, as you go to the right there, she's burning more and more fat at the same power output. And that's gold. So do we have more fat to use for fuel or do we have more carbs? Got a ton more fat. Yeah, a ton more fat for fuel. But you know, back to our evolutionary biology, this bird can fly seven miles without a, without a power bar. It's pretty amazing, you know, uses up all of its, yeah, there's, it's called a Niwat, yeah, like it's pretty crazy. Sled dogs, so mitochondria, if you want to understand mitochondria, these dogs are amazing. 70% more mitochondria than humans, they're mostly carnivorous, and um, their VO2 max is, because their mitochondria are so good, 300 mils per kg per minute, you know, without performance enhancing drugs. So. Exercise is king, nutrition is queen together. You've got a kingdom, Jack LaLanne. You know, this is, we're a doctor, so a lot of the theme of this uh, conference is optimum health. So we want to intervene quickly when someone is out of optimum health. That's the mitochondrial medicine. Squaring off the curve. Ken Cooper was an Air Force flight surgeon. He, he kind of says this, you know, you want to stay young as long as possible and drop dead. You know, you want to be able to get yourself off the floor at age 90. You want to be able to, you know, walk to the store. So that is the purpose of exercise and good nutrition. You can't do one without the other. This, you know, let the, the paper's in there, but exercise, this is all of the cellular adaptations to exercise that will mitigate the aging effects. So I, I don't need to know all this other than it's Betty Betty good for you. Exercise. Sarcopenia, again, I came here to praise strength training. I'm 56, I do more strength training now than I did in my younger years, because I kind of have to, to support. I like to run from my brain, but I do strength training now to prevent this sarcopenia. 80 years old, 60% of my muscle mass is gone unless I do something about it. And you heard about what to do this morning, spot on. You know, what Gabrielle was saying, spot on. And Dan Lehman, I'm glad he was here. You know, he is, we have so much to, you know, we owe so much to people like Dan Lehman. You know, the body's like a grandfather clock. What do you have to do to a grandfather clock every day? Got to wind it up, right? So if, remember, remember nothing else from my talk. Remember that. Breaking down silos. Okay, so we're all about diet, you know, diet, 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 and you see all the diet wars out there. But if we have an exercise focus, say we're kind of failing in that conversation, just something's going on, it's not working well, you know, let's try to focus a little more on the health benefits of the exercise instead of the futile diet, you know, regain. That's just a, a bad cycle for people's brains. Because we know this to be true, it is better to be fit and overweight than unfit and skinny. Okay, so the data, I have multiple articles on that, so that's non-negotiable. Fit and carrying more weight is way better than a VO2 max of nothing and you can't get off of the chair and you're skinny and your BMI is in a healthy range and your cholesterol is wonderful. The most bang for the buck is the first 30 minutes, you know, so mortality curves. You do nothing, you die. The first 30 minutes gives you the most bang for the buck and that's applicable to our patients. You know, anything after that is gravy. But the first 30 minutes is the magic. Where does the magic happen? The mitochondria. What gives people power? Mitochondria. Okay, so what matters about these mitochondria? How many we have? Are they flexible? You know, and you saw a lot of that in earlier talks. Can these mitochondria use carbs? Can they use fat? You know, we need them to use um, the fuels. You know, are they efficient? Can they also get lactate back in? And we'll hit that in a minute. So the efficiency of these mitochondria. Metabolic syndrome patients have broken mitochondria. Cool, so we're gonna fly 10 minutes. Effects of endurance training, more capillaries, more mitochondria. Good, more capillaries, more mitochondria. We want that, we knew this in 1978. That's building a bigger engine. Diet alone does not build more mitochondria. 
Now maybe there's a study on ketogenic diet and exercise and, and improve mitochondria, but I, I think, and again, who knows, exercise, because without exercise you can't build the mitochondria. I think ketogenic diet and exercise is the secret sauce. Acetyl-CoA, so in the mitochondria is this compound called acetyl-CoA. We've got three different energy sources that can get to that. Fatty acids is a massive tank, 40,000 calories. Glycogen, smaller tank, and then we can make ketone bodies. Ketone bodies, glucose, but the fat, it's all about the carbons because the long chain, short chain, medium chain fatty, chain fatty acids have a lot of carbons. They churn through the citric acid cycle and we make ATP, we make energy. So the more we can get the fat in, the better. Now when we crank up the intensity, the oxygen needed and the speed of the fat oxidation in most people is sluggish until you're fully fat adapted. So you're, it's called glycolytic flux. We start shifting to glucose metabolism and we create lactate. Now lactate isn't bad per se. This can be shuttled back into the mitochondria. Where does the fat come from for fuel? So we have fat right there in our muscles, intramuscular triglycerides, well-functioning mitochondria, healthy fat as uh, Nadir Ali talked about. That fat can be used for fuel pretty easily. And then we have fat, you know, we're mobilized, the wiggly jigglies off herself, it's transported to albumin in our bloodstream, with albumin in our bloodstream, and then hits that, again, that citric acid cycle. So that's good to be able to use both of those sources. When we exercise, we recruit from the bottom up. We go out the door, we start walking, we start jogging, riding our bike. We're recruiting these type one fibers. These are called slow twitch fibers. They love fat, they have minimal glycogen, tons of mitochondria. You dial up the speed or you fatigue these fibers, you go into what are called type two fibers. Faster power, less endurance. And we wanna use those, we wanna recruit those. But the key, the, the goal is making sure we've maximized the type one fibers first. Zone two training, so what that is, is the top end of that type one system. It's what is the most power output we can do without needing to go and tap into the fast twitch. And we wanna grow and grow and grow that system. So that would be called zone two, you know, at a physiologic level. You know, zone two and type one fibers, low in glycogen, they love fat. We're building this big fat burning machine, which allows us to use carbohydrates when we need it. The carbohydrates are like the turbo. Now there's another way to recruit these uh, fast twitch fibers and Dr. Peter Snell, they, back in the 60s, they would go out on two hour runs, fasted. So these little uh, bars here are showing fast twitch and slow twitch fibers. So before you go for your run, your fast twitch and your slow twitch fibers are filled with glycogen. So at the hour point, the slow twitch fibers are deplete of the glycogen for the most part, but the fast twitch fibers are still pretty full you haven't really recruited them. But then you gotta turn around and come home without a power bar. You start recruiting the type two fibers with easier running. And this was Peter Snell's whole PhD, was how to recruit those fibers, you know, with all of this endurance training. You know, so the metabolic heart is called a respiratory exchange ratio. We can tell our fat and carb burning from our gas exchange. When we burn carbs, we produce more CO2. <sighs> we have to blow it off. Um, fat burning is less CO2. Oops, that's just a little. This is what happens if anyone's gone on these torture devices. They just keep cranking up the speed, cranking up the speed, cranking up the speed, and then they download all the data, and then you kind of look at where you are. And, you know, my data is actually interesting. You know, several years into a low-carb diet, I can be at about 85% of my VO2 max still burning mostly fat, and that's a good place to be. But that took about literally four to five years to get there, so it's, this isn't a 12 week, any like 12 week study or four week study doesn't mean a thing. Fat max is that effort or pace where you're maximally taxing that system. Crossover point, this is when we're burning more carbs than fat, and we wanna keep moving that to the right, that's your endurance training. So the more you recruit these type one fibers, build these type one fibers, capillary mitochondria, we're using more fat, that's what we want at higher and higher efforts, longer efforts. So that's called the crossover point, move it to the right. Let's talk about lactate here for the last five minutes. So lactate is really important, and now you have all these biohackers with lactate meters and really expensive strips. I don't think you need that, but we can learn a lot from that. This study is from 1960, Clarence DeMar won seven Boston marathons. They tested his lactate. So control 25-year-old male, and you'll see the uh, METs. So the 25-year-old the male, and, and in the 1940s, a 25-year-old male was probably okay fit. 
And you see like the effort and the lactate, this uh, top chart, lactate goes right up. When lactate is up, you can't use fat for fuel. When lactate is up, you can't use fat for fuel. It shuts it off. Look at Clarence DeMar. Like, wow, this guy's like working hard, not producing any lactate. They didn't know about the lactate shuttle then, but this guy was working fine. You know, these are the Norwegians. They're the best triathletes in the world. I don't like their shoes, but they're, I think they're, <laughs> that's called shoe doping. You know, it's like it is. It's called shoe doping. Because, um, so lactate is the obligatory uh, product of glycolysis. This is happening in the cytosol, not the mitochondria. So we produce this lactate. It's associated with a hydrogen ion. Now what we want is that lactate, see that little MCT1 there up in the, that little blue box? So that lactate can go back into the mitochondria and get back uh, pyruvate acetyl-CoA. So the lactate can come right back in. That's good. That's what you want. That happens in the slow twitch fiber. So what happens is you get this glycolytic flux. So the MCT4 transporters from the fast twitch sh shuttle the lactate to the slow twitch fibers. Bring them in and you got energy and you don't have acidity. And that's where the magic happens. And you can do interval training. Okay, so it's called the lactate shuttle. So we'll just kind of go down this uh, one on the right there. So an unfit person, they go out and exercise, they produce the lactate, but they don't have the shuttle. They get acidic and it sucks. The fit person has the shuttle. They make the lactate. They don't even know it because it's going right back into the mitochondria. They feel like a million bucks. They can exercise. You know, there's a couple different lactate cut points. So that type 1 max recruiting is where we would call that uh, the, the lactate threshold 1. So we're just recruiting the type 1 fibers. For most people, it's about 2 millimoles. And then you kind of dial, uh, tighten the screws a little bit, go a little faster. You get to about 4-ish millimoles. And that's when you're using a lot of the type 2 fibers. But you're still, your type 1 fiber is still kind of, you're redlining it there. You're keeping it OK. And then you dial it up a little more, right? And all of you have been there. Then you're like, I can't hold this pace. So you're training that type 1 system to be able to work at a higher effort at that maximum lactate steady state, and that's where races are won. World-class cyclists, they're producing no lactate, like literally none, when the rest of us would make it about two minutes. So that's the difference. They have the perfect mitochondria, and they can eat a lot of carbohydrates. The training effect pushes that curve to the right. So higher watts, less lactate. That means they have better mitochondria. It's a marker of mitochondrial function. The zones, you know, so zone one, zone two, you don't, this is just semantics, but this is type one system. Zone three, if you hear it, then you're using the fast twitch fibers, but it's still purely aerobic. This is still aerobic environment. And then when you get into four or five, it's not really anaerobic. You're still using aerobic power, but your lactate is exponentially going up where you can't clear it as much. Does that make sense? Yeah, you're all kind of knowing your own effort. For runners, you know, this is the linear pyramid. So this zone one, zone two is all the 80% of the training. And then they would do stuff they would call threshold. This is kind of red line training. But it's still fully aerobic. But they're using their type two fibers. And then they would start to do this glycolytic work, right? So to win the race in a 1,500 meter race, they need to be able to sprint. And they need to be able to create energy really fast, even if building up acidity. So training, do we want it to be PISA or GISA? Can I go five more? No, almost done. Yep. We want it to be GISA, right? So big base, high, top. And this is what we did with the Air Force. So to slow them down and they can perform on their PT test, which is a red line event. They all felt they needed more intervals, but none of them were limited by speed. They all could run one lap of the track and what they need to pass their six lap PT test, but none of them could do six laps at that speed. So it's about endurance, not speed. And, but it's a hard, when you have type A military people, they want to hammer it every day. Right? Too much anaerobic work will break you. We're not going to go through that. Just real quick on the med S patients, because, and then I'll finish there. I have all kinds of stuff on the, um, what happens in glucose. To, with exercise and clearing glucose and GLUT4 back door, but we won't have time for that. So I'll just finish with this. Endurance athletes versus the metabolically sick patients. Endurance athletes go out the door and they start burning more and more and more fat because they have great mitochondria up to a point. The recreational athletes, they just shut off fat burning pretty quick. So they become more reliant on carbs. They haven't trained their mitochondria well. So they're doing okay, but again, they're going to drop their fat burning out the door right away and burn more carbs and their little 
you know, Fitbit will say I've burned this much calories, which I think is all kind of stupid. Um, the metabolic, this is Sal Milan and Brooks, the metabolic syndrome patient, they get off the couch, lactate goes up. Whoa, fat burning goes down. So if we tell our med S patients to go do like high intensity, we're gonna crush them. We're just gonna crush them. So their zone two pace is probably something like this. I mean, we just need them to start moving a little bit because they, and fix their diet, they are so metabolically broken compared to someone, you can't apply the same training effects. Yeah, you see as you're going across workloads, the metabolic uh, patient, their lactate uh, goes up, fat burning right down as soon as they get off the couch. So it's really important to understand that. Um, let's see, I don't know why this isn't, okay. But this is, I think, cool too, because the, the best athletes with the best mitochondria, they can burn the most carbs too. Like they can burn up to six grams per minute of carbs, where a diabetic patient, they can't even burn carbs well because their mitochondria suck. So, yeah, so they, that's why these Kenyan athletes can eat tons of carbs. They have perfect mitochondria, but they're burning a ton of fat too. Even though they're eating a lot of carbs, they're burning a lot of fat. And I think that's where people get confused. They're fat burning machines because of their mitochondria. You know, so I'm just gonna, lipid droplets, uh, uh, Nadir talked about this, dysfunctional lipid droplets. You can't, they, they can't be oxidized in the mitochondria. They create all these ceramides, horrible stuff. Glucose disposal, effects of exercise, GLUT4 transport, okay? It's the magic back door to clear glucose. The insulin system isn't working. So by exercising, we bring these magic transporters to the surface of the cell and can clear glucose. So that is the hidden power of exercise. We did a study with these CGMs. We taught diet, we taught exercise, and what they all learned is when they go for a walk, their glucose goes down. They saw it with the, with the Libre. I was like, wow, that's cool. Then they, they learned. We just want to teach people. I'm going to finish there because I have stuff about the adverse effects of the meds and how to train, but I've hit my 30 minutes. Um, we could hit some of this in the Q&A. Yeah. Because <laughs> uh, I did. I'm at my time. Yeah, I have to, yeah, respect the time, but it's a lot of stuff. <laughs>